M S W Media. Thanks to Lomi for supporting the Daily Beans. Start making a positive impact on the environment with the Lomi Home Composter. Get $50 off when you go to Lomi.com slash Daily Beans and use code Daily Beans. And thanks to Athletic Greens for supporting the Daily Beans. Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Just go to athleticgreens.com slash daily beans to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Monday, December 19th, 2022. Today, the Fulton County Grand Jury investigating Donald is preparing its final report. The January 6th committee is set to vote on criminal referrals for Donald today. A judge has unsealed proceedings showing the Department of Justice got John Eastman's emails earlier this year. A Capitol riot defendant planned to kill FBI agents who investigated him. Twitter suspended journalists who have been covering Elon Musk. And the Donald NFT grift is worse than you think. I'm Allison Gill. And I'm Dana Goldberg. Hi, Dana. Happy Hanukkah. Thank you. Happy. Um, This will actually be the first day of Hanukkah when you listen to this. The first night was last night. So I'm wishing all of my Jewish people a very happy Hanukkah and a festival of lights and miracles. And for those of us who love us, I think you should try and celebrate with someone who observes this holiday. It's pretty magical and it's pretty wonderful. So absolutely. hundred percent. Did you have a great weekend? I did. I did. I flew back from New York and uh, now I am uh, in Los Angeles back with you, back with the beans. And it feels nice to be home. Yes. I missed you. I'm glad you're back. And I did get a lot of messages. People missed you while you were gone. So that is nice to hear. Everyone's always like, did you fire her? (laughs) Because sometimes people miss an episode and they're like, why haven't I heard Dana's voice? It's actually Dana's in charge. She she could actually fire me. It's very <laughs> lies. You know. She started lying in the in the in the Jewish holiday. That's what she does. It's because I just voted to to kick Elon Musk off Twitter. He actually put up a poll saying, "Should I leave Twitter? Yes or no?" And and he he said he would stick to whatever the vote is. And he's losing fifty seven to forty three right now. We'll see how it goes. Oh, good lord! I know the fix is in. I'm sure, but it's going to be interesting to see what happens. And also, there's been an issue. On Sunday over the weekend with Megaphone, which is the platform we upload our podcast to, to cast them out to all of the players like Google Play and Apple Podcasts and Stitcher and Overcast and all that. And so there was an issue with the Jack podcast that came out yesterday. We did put it up for free to the public on our Patreon, patreon.com slash Muller, she wrote. You can go and see it for hear it for free there. And uh, we also have it fixed up on Apple Pods ad free as well, just on Apple Podcasts. And we're working on the rest. So I just wanted to give everybody a heads up. The Trump NFT grift is worse oh than we boy. think. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> and I'll be talking to a business fraud expert, Kurt Eichenwald, who who did some digging into the LLC that was set up to handle the transactions and what other criminals are linked to that LLC later in the show. It's pretty impressive. So you don't want to miss that interview. And uh, Dana, real quick, the 1-6 committee will hold a hearing today, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern, to vote on criminal referrals. Normally, I would be live tweeting this, but I'm going to be live posting this on post. My account on post is at Muller She Wrote, just like it is on Twitter. But that's just kind of like a little dig in the eye of uh, Mr. Elon over there. So I will be putting it up on Twitter. If you're still on the post waiting list, it'll just be after. I'm also going to be hosting a live Zoom watch party with patrons today at 1 p.m. Eastern, if we can get that up and running. And so I look forward to that. So those are the little discussion notes that we have. There is a lot of news to get to today. Let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. So this is cool, Dana. Newly unsealed court proceedings dating back to May of this year show that the Department of Justice obtained search warrants for the email accounts of John Eastman, Jeffrey Clark, and another Trump lawyer named Klukowski, and a redacted fourth person long before we knew they had gotten a hold of them. So, you know, while the January 6th committee was battling back and forth with Eastman in court, do you remember all that, where 
Absolutely. He was like, no. Yeah. And Judge Carter was like, sorry, crime fraud exception. These two crimes, these eight emails have to go. These 111 emails have to go. While all that was going on, Department of Justice already had his Chapman University emails. (laughs) They had about 130,000 documents from those four email accounts. And the DOJ set up a filter team to go through them because Jeffrey Clark and John Eastman and Klukowski are lawyers. I don't know who the fourth person is. I assume it's a lawyer, but it might not be a lawyer. Then in May, the same time they were issuing the subpoena for the documents from Mar-a-Lago, the Department of Justice investigative team asked the Department of Justice filter team, hey, could you prioritize emails from those four accounts to and from Congressman Scott Perry? We were really interested in the Scott Perry emails first. And, uh, the, uh, the the court said yes. The judge determined those emails were not subject to attorney-client or work product privilege. And the filter team went through and got all the ones from those four accounts to and from Scott Perry and said to the judge, we don't think these are privileged. The judge agreed and handed them over to DOJ. And within a couple of a months of that, Dana, the DOJ got a warrant to seize Scott Perry's phone. And in order to get a warrant, you have you to- You gotta pre- have, absolutely. <laughs> you have to have probable cause that crimes are on the phone. Something else that the judge ruled had to be handed over were over 330 drafts of Jeffrey Clark's memoir that he's been working on. And pro tip, Dana, if you're criming, don't write it down in a book. And they all seem to do it. Unbelievable. They do. And something of import to the DOJ investigative team was information in that memoir about his draft letter to Georgia that falsely stated there were election irregularities and they should put forth a slate of Trump electors. Remember he wrote, he penned those letters Mm -hmm. and Klukowski helped him write those letters. Also included in the memoir was Trump's reaction to that draft letter and descriptions of the meeting that he had with Donald about it. Very valuable to prosecutors trying to establish intent. And I go over all of this with Andrew McCabe on the latest Jack Pod. And I asked him why DOJ is unsealing these proceedings now. And he had the answer. So you definitely want to tune into that show. And I can only assume, because I'm a comedian, that Eastman thought he'll know if I say these things to Congress under oath, but he doesn't read so I can put them in a book and he'll never see them. <laughs> well, it was Clark, but yeah. But yeah, he, exactly. You know, he was also like, the you know, the guy who's like, hey, are any of those pardons still available? Like in an email, like it's just <laughs> right. the dumb, <laughs> dumbest I mean, so many, 130,000 documents. Oy, all right. Thanks, A.G. Now, a Tennessee man who was previously charged in connection with the Capitol riot, well, he's now facing conspiracy and other charges after allegedly obtaining a copy of a list of law enforcement personnel who played a role in his criminal investigation and discussing plans to kill them. This is according to court filings that were unsealed on Friday. The criminal complaint against Edward Kelly, he's 33, of Maryville, says he obtained the names of law enforcement personnel involved in the probe that led to his initial arrest and discussed plans to kill them and attack the FBI's field office in Knoxville. Austin Carter, who's 26, of Knoxville, he's listed as a co-defendant in this case. The pair were charged with conspiracy, retaliating against a federal official, interstate communication of a threat, and solicitation to commit a crime of violence. Kelly and Carter made their initial appearance in court in Knoxville on Friday. Kelly was already facing charges in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia after he was arrested in Knoxville on May 5th, and he was arrested for allegations that he assaulted a law enforcement officer during the January 6th riot at the Capitol. Well, he was released a week later on a personal recognizance bond. And now, according to these new court filings, the FBA Knoxville office had opened an investigation and assigned agents to Kelly's case after receiving information about his potential involvement at the Capitol on January 6th. The cooperating witness earlier this week, they presented authorities with a, a printed document, including about 37 names, positions, and in some cases, phone numbers of law enforcement personnel involved in the criminal investigation. That's, that's a big fucking deal. And this is from the filings in the state. Now, the list also identified which officers were present when Kelly was arrested in May. That's also in that filing. The witness allegedly told investigators that Kelly discussed collecting intelligence on law enforcement involved in the case and shared plans to kill personnel on the list, saying, quote, with us being such a small group, we will mainly conduct recon missions and assassination missions. 
They put this shit in writing. It's unbelievable. Now, both Kelly and Carter have been detained. Carter has a detention hearing scheduled for Wednesday of this week. Now, Marina Medvin, who has been representing Kelly in the January 6th charges, she didn't immediately respond to a request for comment. Medvin on Friday filed a motion seeking to withdraw, to withdraw as Kelly's attorney. So she's like, I'm fucking out. Yeah. And I have to wonder if this isn't connected to, do you remember when somebody opened fire on the Knoxville? I do. FBI headquarters? Yeah. I have to assume that this is them. And uh, now they're in trouble for that, too. So it's the find out portion of fucking around. Fuck around. Hell yeah. All right. And a, sp- a special grand jury investigating the efforts by the former guy to overturn the 2020 election in Georgia is winding down its work, according to sources familiar with the matter and time. I mean, we all knew it was a six month, you know, special grand jury. The Atlanta area special grand jury has largely finished hearing witness testimony and has already begun writing its final report, according to sources, an indication that prosecutors will soon be deciding whether to seek criminal charges and against whom. In Georgia, special grand juries are not authorized to issue indictments. We've talked about this on the show. The final report serves as a mechanism for the panel to recommend whether Fulton County District Attorney Fannie Willis should pursue indictments in her election interference investigation. She could then go to a regularly impaneled grand jury to get those indictments because Georgia works a little differently. Quote, it's a significant step. It's the culmination of work by prosecutors in the special grand jury, but it shouldn't be taken as any kind of guarantee of a conviction down the road. That's from uh, former U.S. attorney in the Middle District of Georgia, Michael Moore. He said this is just the beginning. Prosecutors had hoped to move ahead with indictments as early as December, sources previously told CNN. But court fights for testimony from high profile witnesses like Lindsey Graham and Michael Flynn and Mark Meadows, all of whom were ordered to testify before the special grand jury, have likely shifted indictments to 2023, according to a person familiar with the situation, knowing that time is indeed linear. Willis has already informed I added that time is linear part. <laughs> Willis has already informed Rudy and 16 Republicans who served as pro-Trump fake electors in the state that they are targets of her investigation. She'll also be scrutinizing Trump and other top lieutenants, including Mark Meadows. The next phase in Georgia comes at a politically and legally perilous time for Donald. His nascent 2024 presidential campaign is off to a sputtering start, (laughs) and he is under Justice Department scrutiny, both for his handling of classified government documents after leaving the White House and for his activities on January 6th and leading up to January 6th. Uh, So we'll see what happens. But uh, that grand jury, that special grand jury is winding down. She hasn't applied for another one. So I'm assuming she's ready to make her decisions. All right. Thanks, AG. Now, there was a shit show over the weekend on Twitter with journalists accounts getting suspended. Now, amid this intense backlash and accusations of violating press freedom, Twitter has now reinstated the accounts of several journalists who were suspended over the last several days, though at least one remains suspended. Now, on Thursday night, the social media platform suspended several reporters who had tweeted or written about who? Elon Musk's ownership of the company. Thin-skinned billionaire. Now, among the accounts that went dark were Uh, Donnie O'Sullivan from CNN, Ryan Mack from the New York Times, Drew Harwell of Washington Post, Michael Lee, Michael Lee of Intercept, and Aaron Ruper, who we love and follow. Now, on Friday evening, Musk put the decision of whether to reinstate suspended accounts up for a public vote. He tweeted an informal poll, which asked Twitter users to choose when to, quote, unsuspend accounts who doxed his exact location in real time. By the way, that actually didn't happen. I listened to some things on Twitter. There were actually live chat rooms going on. That's not what happened with these journalists. Now, according to the poll, 58.7% of voters favored lifting the suspensions immediately over 41.3% of respondents who said Musk should wait seven more days. Rupert, whose account was reinstated on Friday, said the suspension signaled Twitter's instability. This is a quote. It's a clear illustration that it is no longer a rules-based company. And this is again from Rupert. He told this to NPR. It's basically a company based on Elon Musk's whims and the terms of service depend on his mood each day. Now, Lynette Lopez, a business inside reporter who previously covered Musk, said her account was suspended on Friday after she tweeted court documents that revealed Musk had hacked and doxed people in the past. While Washington Post columnist Taylor Lorenz said her account was briefly suspended on Saturday evening after seemingly asking Musk to comment on an upcoming story. The Lorenz said she was told from Twitter support that her account was permanently banned. It appeared to be active again as of Sunday. 
afternoon, Sunday afternoon. Now, meanwhile, Lopez's account, that one still remains suspended as of Sunday. And she said she had not heard from the company as to why. Yeah, yeah. I called it um, the Thursday Night Massacre. That caught on and went viral. But wow, yeah, that was a frightening little uh, blip. And and I actually te- I actually texted a friend. I'm like, I bet he's going to, uh, he was never going to keep them suspended. It was just kind of like a warning shot, you know, like to totally. chill people to report on him and bring him back. And, and that's that's precisely what happened. Uh, also of note, by the way, today, photos emerged on the Internet all over of, of Jared Kushner and Elon Musk at the World Cup together in a in a box, both both heavily funded by the Saudis, by the way. Oh, yeah. So it's not surprising they're pals. Well, you know, you're, you uh, the company you keep says a lot about you. Yeah. And if I may, just a little comment on that World Cup. My God, if anyone watched that, <laughs> one of the best World Cups I've ever seen. It was absolutely crazy. I mean, I don't like when games get decided by penalties because I feel like that's just, I mean, one, the pressure on the goalie is substantial. And two, it's just really unfortunate when that comes down to that for such an important game. I'm really happy. Like, I love France. They're an incredible powerhouse. I'm so happy that Messi got his World Cup after all of these years. He finally got it on the resume. So it was beautiful. The goals, I mean, Argentina was up 2-0 until almost the first, almost the end of regular time. (laughs) France got two goals in 90 seconds. It was the craziest shit I've ever seen. And then it went back and forth and over to in um, extra time. And then we went to penalties. But my God, if you're a World Cup fan, and I am a big one, obviously, and I haven't always watched the men, I'll be honest, that shouldn't shock anyone. If you know me, um, I was super impressed with this World Cup. It was incredible. Yeah. And that third goal to tie it didn't come until 24 minutes into extra time. It was bananas. And then, yeah, I wish they would just keep playing until somebody scored a goal. But it was... uh, yeah, a lot of my friends are like, well, I don't really need to watch soccer anymore. That was pretty, pretty much the best game I've ever seen. I, I don't know if we're going to see a better one than that. It was phenomenal. Yeah, I, mean, it, I hate that it was in Qatar. We'll, we'll ignore that. It was phenomenal. Yep. And I hate that Jared and Elon were there watching it together. <laughs> 100%. With all the Saudis, but whatevs. All right. Up next is my interview with uh, Kurt Eichenwald. He is a New York Times bestselling author. He's also like 30 years of uh, uh, in business fraud as an expert. And we're going to talk about the Trump NFT scam. Stick around. We'll be right back. After these messages, we'll be right back. Hey, everybody, it's AG. And I want to talk about AG, Athletic Greens. I use it literally every day. I started taking it about a year and a half ago because I wanted to have more energy. I wanted a supplement that tasted better than what I was used to, and I wanted to replace the 20 million different supplements and vitamins that were taking up cabinet space and costing me a fortune. But with just one tasty scoop of AG1 by Athletic Greens, you get 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day the best way possible. The special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, nervous system, immune system, aging, energy, recovery, focus, all the things. And we want to thank Athletic Greens for their support. Right now, they're offering you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase when you go to athleticgreens.com slash daily beans. It tastes so good. And I make sure to take it first thing after I wake up before the gym. It helps with my mental clarity and alertness. And in 2020, Athletic Greens purchased carbon credits that support projects protecting old growth rainforests. You know how I love that goodwill. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. Easiest habit I ever picked up. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash daily beans. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash daily beans to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I am happy to be joined by a New York Times bestselling author and former senior writer for The Times with a new post out on his Substack, which is threats.substack.com. And it's called Trump's trading card grift is worse than you think. And it really is. Please welcome Kurt Eichenwald. Hi, Kurt. Hi. Thanks for having me. It's really great to have you. This is a very important piece. I've shared it on all my social media sites. Uh, don't tell Elon that I've shared it on other things besides Twitter. 
But, you know, this is a very important post because there's all sorts of things in here. You did a pretty deep dive on all sorts of shell companies, rubbing elbows with international criminals, as you put in your lead. And, you know, I had been asking a little bit earlier, like, this seems like a really good way to launder money. Everything comes (laughs) in at under $10,000, which, you know, doesn't trigger the Bank Act, the Bank Security Act. Tell me a little bit about what you found when you dove into what's going on with the uh, huge announcement of the NFT trading cards. Well, the announcement was scuzzy enough as as it possibly could be. It really did look like something you'd see it, you know, when you wake up in the middle of the night at 3 a.m. on a channel just after the, uh, you know, have you been damaged by? I mean, it just it was awful. And it it had a it had a thing saying, go to this site. And I went to the site and the cards themselves, which are just digital things, were obviously terrible photoshops. I mean, they were just ridiculous. And it it's had all the earmarks of something that was not involving people of high quality or people who were interested in producing something that people would actually want to buy. And so I started reading down the questions, you know, the answers to questions, and it became very clear once you dug into the into the um, fine print that you really didn't own these things uh, in the tr- traditional sense of ownership. Everything you did, you had to kick back money to this group, and I'll get into that in a second. And then I read in this that there was an entity that was called uh, CIC. And CIC was, if you think about it, CIC Digital. CIC is commander in chief. Mm-hmm. So clearly this was going to be Trump. And when I you know, looked at its connections, it was Trump. And the fine print said, CIC, you can't, in this transaction, you can't sue CIC International. You can't sue Trump. You can't sue uh, the Trump, the Trump Corporation because all of it has been licensed to something else called NFT International. Well, you know, I did corporate fraud for 30 years. And once you start having multiple layers of entities, including some that are, you know, partnerships that can't be sued, you know, my antenna go up. And so NFT International was the th- and the, and CIC were the two things to look at. And I looked at the um contact information. You know, if you have a problem with your cards, contact here and there was an address. And so I started, you know, with a suite number and I started digging down into that and it ended up being a UPS box in uh in Utah. But that wasn't the final point. Oh, no, of course not. (laughs) And from there, it went to it was connected in terms of where it was registered to an entity in Wyoming. And I already knew the address of this play. It would just say it was address here. I already knew the address because it is renowned among corporate fraud guys as the place to go to find a story because it sets up shell companies that are frequently used by fraudsters, by criminals, by international criminals, and they get registered and they all move their headquarters to this little brick house. And I mean, literally a little brick house in uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming. And that is where the, the, the owner, the producer of Trump's trading cards was well what else was there somebody you know an international criminal uh who embezzled millions of dollars people who were on the hook for fraud against uh the US military tax cheats wire fraud fo- i mean you just start going down the list and it was like 60 different criminal enterprises or or groups that have been accused of being criminal enterprises in litigation And there is, joining them, the former president of the United States. (laughs) And it it just said to me, oh, this is so wonderful. This is so delicious. 
And so I decided, you know, I had to write all of this up as a sub stack to let people understand that you're dealing with this entity, NFT International, which has successfully hidden who owns it and what they do, but they're clearly just a scuzzy operator, and that they all flow down to a place with a bunch of criminals. Mm -hmm. And it just, you know, for a minute I was like, oh my God, how can a former president be wrapped up like this? I was like, it's Trump. <laughs> of course he's wrapped yeah. up with people like this. And this is your wheelhouse. You you immediately recognize the address of the of the little brick house in Cheyenne, which I think yeah. is pretty incredible. And, and given your background, I have a couple questions for you. There was a couple of people who pointed out on Twitter that the uh, Bank Security Act looks at and flags transactions, cash transactions over $10,000. And he limited 100 of these NFT cards at $99, bringing any tra that transaction in at $9,900. Now, it was asked of me and several other people were asking, well, those are only cash transactions. But isn't it true that any credit or debit or crypto that he withdraws as cash is considered a cash transaction? I'm not sure how that works. Well, but technically it is. But the 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 thing is, particularly with crypto, it's not really traceable, you know, so and that's what well, at any crypto amount so dangerous is that you can move 50 million dollars in crypto and it doesn't automatically trigger the anti money laundering statutes. And so, you know, Trump's whole thing, if you go through it, it's about $4.5 million. Now think about how pathetic that is. This man who is quote unquote a billionaire, which he's not, is scamming. His well, he laundered $50 million selling a mansion in Florida to Rob Lovelace. Oh, yeah. I mean, he also, turn around and sell it. he also, so four, his first 4.5 million is chump change, yeah. right? And, and his first money laundering scheme was actually in the 1980s when, uh, when uh, Trump Castle was, was heading toward bankruptcy and it was in violation of the terms of the loans with the banks and it needed to have more money. So his dad's lawyer came in with a literally a suitcase full of cash, bought a bunch of chips uh, and left. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, that was the whole uh, we we learned that through uh, Too Much or Never Enough. The, the Mary Trump book is the first time I learned about that, uh, yeah. you know, casino chip Monday. He got Monday. sanctioned by the Atlantic City Gaming Board for money laundering. Yeah. And, you know, you sort of look there and go, you know, oh, this man of God. Oh, you know, which is a friggin lie. Uh, <laughs> oh, he's so wonderful. He's so great. And it's like, oh, he's a con artist. Mm -hmm. He's a con artist and a criminal. And he always has been, you know, back. When, remember, I was covering corporate fraud back in the 1980s. Well, I covered Donald Trump. <laughs> my my very first phone call with him was on my very first day as a reporter. I had literally written nothing for the New York Times. And there is no way, you know, I, I had written freelance articles for a bunch of obscure publications. And my first conversation, I called to speak to his spokesman and he got on the phone, which freaked me out. And I identified me, myself and he said, oh, Kurt, I love your stuff. <laughs> you just lied to me. You've never read anything I've written. And so, yeah, the 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 relationship with him went on from there. He lies about everything, everybody he's associated with one way or the other. Oh, yeah, I have a, I have a personal connection. My mom was in the Building Owners and Managers Association in Arizona, and, and then it moved out to work in California with some uh, legal firms on commercial buildings. And uh, they had hired the Trump firm for they had been subcontracted to the Trump firm for some construction. Then he never paid that bill. They, they still he still owes my mom like 10 grand. And then uh, and then my mom did a bunch of work to stop him from putting a Trump Tower up in Palm Springs. They were like, no way we're letting this, you know, guy move in here to Palm Springs. And so she successfully kept him out of Palm Springs, which I'm, I personally as is a familial point of pride for me. But something else that's really interesting is that the person running this CIC, which is connected to NFT International and everything that you've posted here in your Substack, again, it's threats.substack.com. Everybody needs to check it out, is Nick Luna, the body man, right? The guy who's been working for Trump forever. 
He had to testify to the one six committee. Uh, he's he's been sort of in and around a lot of things that Donald has said. It's kind of reminiscent of him putting Devin Nunes in charge of, you know, the business that runs Truth Social, which is also under, well, is currently under federal criminal investigation and also by SEC and FINRA and the Southern District of New York. So he's doing real well. Well, it's it makes sense that he would put in somebody like Luna because, number one, he's a Trump acolyte. Number two, the whole role of CIC is to be, you know, sort of a partnership bagman for Donald Trump because CIC, you know, I, Trump has been doing this licensing of his name for about 12 years <laughs> and all of them are structured the same way. He gets a major payment up front. So I have no uh, no doubt that NFT International has already paid CIC, which then gets pushed up the line into Donald Trump's pocket. And then he gets a portion of every sale and a portion of every resale. And so, you know, Trump already has pocketed a lot of money. And Luna doesn't have to do anything but sort of sit there as a figurehead and let this uh you know, sluice fund, (laughs) the cash flow through CIC and go up to Donald Trump through whatever partnership he has up there, because it's not going to go directly into his pocket. You know, it's going to do something else. And when I I think about the fact that he's lost a lot of his money laundering laundromats, I guess, if you want to say, I mean, the Trump organization, you're not going to try to launder money through the Trump organization and real estate deals now. It's under a lot of scrutiny Mm -hmm. and both New York Attorney General Tish James and now again Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg criminally looking into it, civilly suing them for $250 million. They're under the eye of a monitor, retired uh, Judge Barbara Jones, who has been appointed to monitor uh, while the civil suit is pending by the New York Attorney General. And that covers all of his real estate. And so you're not going to be able to do that. And then, of course, Deutsche Bank won't touch him with a 10-foot pole. I don't think the Latin capital will lend to him now. So he has no other way to get money. And so especially no other way to launder money. So it's, it's I think it's really interesting. I, I, I fully believe that once it becomes clear to and I'm sure it's becoming clear already to uh, foreign nations that he is not going to be president again, and I do not believe he will, because I think finally, the, you know, the Republicans will put up with everything but losing, you know. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And I think you're going to get touch on my third point. Now that he's running for president, he's under all of his packs and everything are now under scrutiny right. from the FEC. Not that they have any teeth right now, no. but. And but once he gets once he loses or once it appears that he loses or maybe even now. You know, the Saudis, the Russians, every, all these people who've been flowing money to him are going to back off because they're going to know every dollar we spend, every dollar we put into this guy's operations could come back to bite us in the ass. Oh. And so I fully believe that we will see a complete collapse of the Trump organization within the next three or four years. Yeah. And if not, I'm going to be really interested where his money came from, because, you know, there's only so much he can steal from MAGA and there's only so much he can take. And he has been has been doing this. There's only so much he can take out of his political fundraising and pocket, you know. And so- yeah. And now the NRA is under scrutiny. So there's not a lot of money that's going to be funneled through there. Uh, and of course, the, the if he can't win, there's no inaugural that he can scam. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're here where now he's selling trading cards uh, through <laughs> through a, and through and and Christmas wrapping paper mm-hmm. and his wine glasses. I feel like when he was down there trying to eat and shred or sell the, uh, the 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 classified documents, he found a bunch of like old wine glasses and maybe some steaks and some stuff. <laughs> and like he's just selling everything out of storage now. Like, well, he owes four hundred million dollars that's coming due next year, next I year? think. And, you know, I'm going to be real in- interested to find out where that money comes from. Yeah. Do you think Kushner will lend it to him, lend him his two, some of his two billion <laughs> Saudi dollars? <laughs> I think, well, Kushner can't because he's operating a fund. 
And so if he <laughs> he would have to invest in something Trump wise and that could be deemed by, you know, all the fund investors are going to be told. Now, that might be a means of laundering money from the Saudis, but, you know. Yeah, he could invest in uh, Trump NFT trading cards. Yeah, I hey. <laughs> Well, Kurt, it's been really great talking to you. Uh, I recommend everybody follow you on Twitter. And of course, and post because Twitter says we can't tell people where we, where we are anymore. I'm at post.news. Go with at Kurt Eichenwald is my is my name is same as on my Twitter account. Cool. Yes. And post. And also, please go subscribe. Subscribe. It's threats.substack.com. I really encourage you. There's a lot of important things. And if you want to continue to follow this story, I know that you're going to be posting a lot about it as as things unfold. And I'm sure as investigations open up, but they're they're, you know, in three, two, one, we're going to start seeing some uh, FINRA and at least SEC investigations and then possibly, you know, uh, what would it be? The Middle District of Florida? I don't know. (laughs) Well, I'm also I'm also like looking forward to the collapse of Truth Social uh, because everything there is just falling apart. Yeah, the SPAC, the DWAC, that whole, uh, so I think Southern District is looking into that. But, you know, maybe maybe it's the Wyoming uh, U.S. Attorney's Office that will <laughs> be looking into There's so many places to go. Cards. Too much crime, too little time. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate your time today. Kurt Eichenwald. We'll be right back with the good news. Hey, everybody, I used to spend a lot of time worrying about how much garbage my household generated every week. I wanted to try composting to help cut back, but it always seemed too complicated and burdensome and I didn't have space for it. And then I discovered Lomi. The Lomi Home Composter is the odor-free, mess-free solution to keep your food waste out of landfills. Lomi makes your food waste disappear in under four hours and it fits inside any kitchen, big or small. Now I throw away way less garbage. That means it isn't going into landfills and producing methane. Plus there's no smell when it runs and it's really quiet and it's a very cool looking little unit. Now I feel less guilty than I used to because I know I'm helping do my part by cutting down on the food waste that I have. So if you want to start making a positive environmental impact or just make cleaning up after dinner that much easier, Lomi is perfect for you. Head to Lomi.com slash Daily Beans and use promo code Daily Beans, all one word, to get $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you head to Lomi, L-O-M-I dot com slash Daily Beans and use promo code Daily Beans at checkout. Food waste is gross. Lomi is your solution. And with the holidays just around the corner, Lomi will make the perfect gift for someone on your list. Everybody, welcome back. It's time for the good news. Who likes good news? Good news, good news. And if you have any good news, confessions, corrections, pod pets, uh, letters to Santa or the Easter Bunny or the Tooth Fairy or shit kids say or shit adults say or shit you say, anything you want to send to us, you can do so by going to dailybeanspod.com and clicking on contact. Also, again, our podcast hosting platform was acting real funny on Sunday. Not ha ha funny. Full on what the fuck is going on funny. (laughs) And as a result, the latest episode of Jack may only be available through the Patreon link that we made public or Apple Podcasts. And we're putting it up on YouTube. So hopefully by tomorrow, the whole thing is sorted out when everybody gets back from their weekend. Just wanted to put that out there. So let's kick this off with Christy from Jefferson City. I recently discovered your podcast and I'm really enjoying it. I heard you wanted to see a frog orgy. (laughs) Christy, thank you for not questioning the origin of that. And I remembered some pictures I took at the zoo a few years ago. Two different couples, same tank. And here's a picture of my dog, Oliver. It's not hard to guess his breed. Full on mini doxy. But we got him from a rescue when he was four months old. He's now three. And his superpower is cuddling. Excellent. Oh, my God. There is legit a frog orgy for you, AG. (laughs) Well, it's two frogs. But, you know, hey. Uh, There's three in the first picture. Oh, maybe that's the reflection. (laughs) (laughs) I'll pretend it's three. I'm okay. You know what? Obviously, I haven't intended. I haven't attended a lot of frog orgies. You were very clear that Dana. That's only two, and I was like, it looks like three. <laughs> Look at the puppy. Look at the oh, so oh sweet baby. Oh my god, I love you. I love that. Thank you very much. Now, Mariah, this is Mariah. Pronounce she and her. Hi, Ag and Dg. Mom of Hammy McBacon Fat here. I owe y'all another good news post for my Whoopi story, but this post needed to happen first. I have an idea for another thing we can share as a group. 
holiday decor. I'd like to share a picture of our Christmas tree. It'll be hard to see, but our decorations range from Scottish terrier nutcracker to crocheted cat butts, from <laughs> blow in the dark jellyfish to a Fender guitar, from a rubber chicken in a Santa suit to a little black ball that just says atheist. And no tree of ours would be complete without giant googly eyes. I hope this tree brings you as much joy as it did to us. <laughs> I mean, that is definitely a hodgepodge of shit and it's still absolutely beautiful. Okay, Mariah, the googly eyes remind me of there's a, a Christopher Walken SNL skit called The Very a Nervous Gardener, and he puts googly eyes on all of his plants because he doesn't trust them. <laughs> this is what That's that hilarious. reminds me of. Thank you for sharing that. That is so awesome. Next up from Anonymous, no pronouns given, pet tax. I'm a dog guy. I had two lovely and beautiful dogs, Shepherd Pitbull Mix and the other a full doby. They were both 100 plus pounds and both lasted 16 years consecutively, not concurrently. Big girls love them dearly. We have a mouse issue, and my wife's told me we're getting a cat. Now I'm a cat lady. Said cat sleeps on my head. No idea why. I try to ignore her. Perhaps that is why. Anonymous, that is exactly why. The, the more you dislike cats, the more they cuddle with you and sleep on you. Oh, my God. So sweet, though. So cute. Indeed. All right. This is also from Anonymous, but pronouns <laughs> she and her. <laughs> Hello, queens of daily beans. I love your show, and I listen to it every morning while I walk my dog. I always sing along with the theme song and still crack up every time I hear hot notes replace the original hot stuff lyrics of Donna Summer song. Hot stuff. <laughs> now my Shih Tzu Poodle Mix Chewbacca turns 15 on Susan B. Anthony's birthday, December 19th. That is today. We adopted him when he was three and he has been such a good boy all these years. He absolutely hates wearing clothes, but I'm attaching a photo of him in the Halloween costume my wife made him the first year we had him, when we didn't know better. She could not resist dressing him up as an Ewok, and he, and he wore the costume for just as long as it took for us to take the photo of him before making it clear that this would never happen again. Also, since you asked for letters to Santa, I'm attaching a historical relic, a letter my dad wrote to Santa back in 1934. He grew up to be a journalist, and I think there are early signs of his future profession in this letter. I especially love that he did background research and that he typed it. Unfortunately, he did not get what he asked for that year, times being what they were. And this <laughs> fucking dog dressed in an Ewok is hysterical. Now, what does this letter say? Here we go. All right. Dear Santa Claus, please bring me a sled, and I would like two let me hold on yeah and i would like also oh i would like to uh a chin now whoops i was making that bigger and i got too big i would like a chin rest <laughs> and a shoulder rest for my violin oh right i believe that is all this will be about my last letter to you since i'm nine years of age <laughs> <laughs> loads of love jay i don't want to say the name just in case uh lb64 richland iowa p.s i would like to have the the brown sled up at Fred Smith's and uh, named the the sled the sled king the speed cost, king I think it's the speed, speed king. king speed king it costs two dollars and seventy cents <laughs> plus three and cents three cents tax that's amazing oh nineteen thirty four December fifteenth nineteen thirty four oh now my for God. those of you that are young listening to the podcast this was typed on a typewriter that's something that is not plugged into the computer it does not have a hard drive it has a lot of keys that used to get stuck in nineteen thirty four and then you would have to take white out and, and cover them up he sounds like he's forty except for the sled part right like I would like I said and also a chin rest and a shoulder rest for my violin I believe that is all and this will be this about would be about my last letter. <laughs> Since I am nine years of age and years is abbreviated. Oh my God. It really does. That is definitely an old soul right there. Absolutely adorable though. This is fantastic. Oh, and the Ewok dog. So great. Please send in your letters to Santa. I absolutely love that. And thank you everyone for sending in your good news stories. Thanks for the frog orgy. I appreciate it. And uh, hey, Dana, do you have any final thoughts? No final thoughts. Just like I said before, happy Hanukkah to everyone and uh, continue to light the lights and celebrate the miracles that are around you because they are everywhere. You just have to look for them. 100%. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll be back tomorrow. Until then, please take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet. Take care of your mental health. Vote blue over Q. And take everyone with you. <laughs> I've been AG. And I've been DG. And them's the beans. 
The Daily Beans is written and executive produced by Allison Gill, with additional research and reporting by Dana Goldberg and Amy Carrero. Sound design and editing is by Desiree McFarlane, with art and web design by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. Music for The Daily Beans is written and performed by They Might Be Giants, and the show is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, please visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media. <laughs>